Um, I can't convince them of that, but in my mind, I'm related. I'm with a company called PowerNet, and we're out of uh, Cincinnati. I'm based in Cincinnati. Um, we are a national company that we have our own voice network. Uh, we're a full technology solutions provider for a variety of, of different types of uh, facilities. We also have a, a big presence in Florida with sales and engineering and support staff. And my role mainly has been, I've been with the company 11 years and it has been wireless, any kind of wireless. Um, today, I wanna to talk just about a portion of that, which is the public safety. And I'm gonna to try to make it interesting, which it's not. And I also come from the engineering side of our company and Jim's talking about, you know, how do we fix culture in a company? I come from the engineering side, which usually is the problem with the culture in a facility. So, um, for the, the public safety signal boosters, though, I want to uh, define it so that when you leave today, you have an idea of what exactly it is, um, what it does in your facility, whether or not you need one, how to determine if you need one. And if you have more questions, you can see us at our booth and we can explain that a little bit further. But um, I want to actually explain, well, uh, okay guys. I'm not able to advance. Thank you. I am an engineer. <laughs> I need a five-year-old to come up here and show me what to do. So, with public safety, you're going to hear terms like public safety DAS or public safety signal booster. And so I want to explain what exactly that is, but today we're going to talk about what the code <laughs> process is, what the enforcement is, how you determine what happens in your local jurisdiction, and then we're going to talk about why all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, it seems like it's more necessary, why we're having that, uh, the need for it. The public safety signal booster is the same type of idea as what you have in the cell booster. Does anybody in here already have a public safety signal booster system in your facility? I don't see anybody yet. We've done several. We're in the process of doing some in, in Cleveland and in some other areas, and we've done some here locally as well. All it does is you'll see at the top left of that photo or that, that picture is a, an antenna that takes a signal from outside your building brings it into an FCC approved amplifier that then distributes that signal throughout your building so that you have a consistent signal level throughout your building for firefighters when they come in. Firefighters use a, a device similar to this, which is a two-way radio system, and they are responsible for signal outside your building, but you are responsible for the signal coverage inside the building. And there are specific things that are mandated by code that you have to do for your building for signal coverage so we'll talk about that a little bit as well but what's all of a sudden causing the need for these more because you're going to hear about it a lot more especially in Florida uh, things are getting more strict here in fact this year Florida um, in updated their building code um, it's actually uh, chapter 633 uh, section 202 paragraph 18 and it's for high-rise buildings that's what they're addressing right now high-rise is anything where a residential floor is uh, 70 feet no more than 70 feet above the lowest area that a first responder would enter your building so according to that code any high-rise building we do have a, a uh, senior living customer that is going to be classified as a high-rise building but uh, by December of 2019 Everybody will have to have a survey done in their high-rise building that shows whether or not they are in compliance with code. And then at that point, if your building is not in compliance, you have until 2022 to put in a system to rectify the problem. So that is, that is current Florida building code at our booth. I have some copies of that if you want to take a look at that. Typically in your industry, we're not dealing with high-rise buildings, but there are some, so you need to be aware of that. But you also need to be aware that code is getting more strict and it will affect every building. 
regardless of what you're going through. It also is definitely affects all new buildings. So there are a couple things to keep in mind. What's happening though is with new construction, and if, if you've done some new buildings, you know that what's being pushed a lot is what's called LEED certification, which is an environmental and energy uh, design, which requires a certain level of concrete and steel uh, in the building. And so as buildings are built to different levels of LEED certification, that can impede signal from entering your building. And then once buildings are built, you have steel um, throughout your building. You have uh, smaller rooms now than we used to in some cases, and a lot of floors. And so what happens is not only are we impeding signal coming into the building, we are making it more difficult to propagate signal inside the building. And you could have areas that are great, you could have areas that are really bad. But what happens is, imagine a scenario like this, which we had last year, a customer that we were doing a lot of technology for, 160,000 square foot building. Outside the building, the signal was a neg 48. So what that means is it was a perfect signal. It was incredible. Should have had no problem with the building. They were getting close to CO. As the fire inspector walked through the building, his radio kept going off. So he tried to key and talk to the tower. He couldn't talk to the tower. He tried to key and talk to his crew, and he couldn't. And so he kept walking the building. He thought maybe it was just something that was, that was odd with his radio. But he had no area inside the building where he could communicate back to his dispatch center. So he turned to the construction manager, the owner, and said, unfortunately, I can't give you CO until you put in a public safety signal booster. And it caught everybody by surprise because the signal outside was incredible. What happened was they were building in such a way that it, it basically cut off signal completely inside the building. So it's difficult sometimes. What, what we tell our customers now is if you're doing new construction, just assume up front that you should budget for a public safety signal booster so that you're not caught off, off guard at the end when you're expecting CO and then somebody tells you you have to have a $30,000 or $60,000 signal booster. So let me explain a little bit about some terms you'll hear. Um, you will hear talks about uh, signal booster. You will hear public safety DAS. Think of it like this, your, your signal booster is just a term for a passive DAS, means distributed antenna system, and all that means is we're bringing in a signal from outside and we're amplifying that signal. We are not adding anything to that building. In the cellular world, if I do a DAS, an active DAS, that means I am, I'm adding capacity to the network. I'm, I'm essentially putting a tower at your building, and then I am broadcasting that signal out. In a passive DAS, I'm not doing that. I'm just receiving signal from outside and then amplifying it in your building. And when a system is designed, you want to have the same type of signal that you have outside distributed evenly throughout your building. Same way you do in Wi-Fi and everything else. You want to have the same user experience in one part of the building as you do in another. So we do the same thing in public safety. But you need to be aware there are no federal laws that mandate that you have to do this. Okay. By the way, I'm taking a 45 minute technical presentation and I'm trying to make it 15 minutes of general discussion. So uh, just bear with me if it seems like I'm skipping over some things. In public safety, when uh, we're, what we're dealing with is not federally mandated law, it is uh, building code. It's code from NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. It's code from uh, International Fire it's International Fire Code 510. States will adopt one of those two. And then everything is mandated on a local level. So you'll see here that we have code that's set up. And that code tells us what level of coverage I have to have in my building. And it tells me what that signal strength has to be like. It tells me that every device that's put in has to be FCC certified, and it has to clearly display that on the outside of the box with a two inch label. Um, it tells me that everybody that works on it has to be FCC certified. They have to be have what's called a general radio operator's license. 
and have to have knowledge of the system that's in place with that local jurisdiction, that county. So for example, Palm Beach County will have a frequency that is designated for them for the downlink, meaning that's what's received when the firefighter's in the facility. They will have a frequency that's, that's designated for the uplink, which is I key the device and I talk. So they will also, when they work with companies like us, they will let us know, here's what we expect and how that's built. When it's in the electrical room, here's the way it needs to look. It needs to be 12 hours of battery backup, or it needs to be tied into a, a generator circuit. What you'll find is every jurisdiction is different. There are certain things they have to do, but I've got a facility that we did where the fire inspector said, I know they have the battery backup rule, but I don't care about that. I want it on a dedicated generator circuit. Then we have one in Cleveland where the fire chief said, I don't care about the generator. I want the 12 hour battery. So it all comes down to what your local jurisdiction is going to tell you. So there's no cookie cutter solution. There's not one that you're going to say, this happened in this jurisdiction, it's going to happen over here in another county. So there are certain uh, code that we have to follow, but there will be some uh, give and take. One of the things that's driving this, in 2015, Broward County had an issue where several of these systems were put in and caused interference on the county system. By the way, if you put this system in, and the uplink side of that, which handles amplifying their talking back to their tower, talking back to their dispatch center. If that is not handled correctly, it can take down the system for the entire county. So it's something you've got to make sure that you're dealing with a reputable firm that understands that and is working hand in hand with the fire chief or the radio operator for that, that county. Um, in Broward's case, they, they were able to identify the source rectify the issue, but then they came back and made their code very strict. And the expectation is that everybody else is going to begin doing that in, in Florida. So Ohio is a lot different. Our code is, um, is different and they have adopted IFC 510, but they are basically very similar in how they approach everything, how it's designed. And the way it affects you is in, uh, if you're doing a new building, you need to expect that you will have to have one. Just plan on it. Um, if your building is tested and your signal's fine, then, then you're good. Um, but if you budget for it, plan for it, and that time comes, then you're set, you're okay. You can do some things early in the construction process where you can kind of guess what's gonna happen in the building, but really, unless those walls start going up, it's difficult to know what it's gonna end up and whether or not you have to have it. So there are some requirements. I have one here that's a, uh, what's called a NEMA 4 enclosure is required by FCC. It has to go through certification from FCC's uh, OET, which is their engineering that they certify devices. And that has to be clearly labeled on the outside of the device when it goes in. Um, it also has to have a, uh, a fire rating. It has to meet a certain code for that. The NEMA 4 enclosure simply means that it's a, uh, they actually take like 90 pounds per square inch of water pressure and shoot it at the device for 10 minutes and it has to be able to do that without taking a leak. I shouldn't say taking a leak. <laughs> Leaking! I just wanted to make sure everybody's still awake. Because if it were me right now and I was eating, I'd probably be sleeping too, so. When, if you end up in, a, in either new construction or existing building, I want to go through with you, if you were working with our company or anybody like us that is a reputable firm, the process that you're going to go through to determine if you need one in your facility. So a first thing that a company will do is they're going to be in contact with the fire chief and they're going to find out what frequencies do you use on the uplink and downlink in your local jurisdiction. They're going to talk to them about where the towers are located and then they'll come into your, your facility with a device similar to this which is just it's a, a, a small spectrum analyzer, and there are many of them. We have big ones and little ones. This one is designated pretty much just for public safety. We go in and we key in the exact frequency for that local jurisdiction, so we know what our downlink and uplink is. And then uh, we do a site survey of the building, which means outside completely. 
which means inside every room in the building, especially critical areas. And then we come back with the results. And I will show you a, we'll, we'll uh, take a look at, so it's just a, just a spreadsheet similar to this. This is actually from one in Cleveland we did. And when we did the building, when it was first, it was a, an existing building that was being demoed, renovated. And when we did the original one with all the walls going, it didn't pass in any area of the building at all, except on the fourth floor. And there were just some areas that passed. When all the walls were built and we just went back in three weeks ago, it was actually even worse. And so you know, there's no choice. At that point, the fire inspector or fire chief is writing a letter to the owner and saying, I'm sorry, but you have to have this booster. Unfortunately, he's, he was understanding this could happen. So you'll get something similar to this, and then out of that will come your design process. And typically, what you want is the manufacturer of the device to actually be the one doing the design. Then we use a tool called IB Wave. So you want to look for that, and all that does is model what signal looks like inside your building. So you're, you know before it's ever put in, this is what I should expect, and it's extremely accurate. So you're gonna want the manufacturer to do that process. The manufacturer will then come back to uh, companies like us and provide this for us, which is a design that shows exactly how that's gonna be built in your facility. They will show the outside antenna, where that cable comes into the amplifier, and then where it's distributed throughout your facility. That has to go to the fire chief as well. And they put that on record so that when the system is built, they have a, a baseline from which to judge how we do. So then after that process, you'll go and uh, you actually have to have a permit. When they test, they walk through with the electric contractor, the owner, with us, and then just determine whether or not it met what we said it would do. These are some photos of some uh, that we actually did uh, typically, we're going to be in distributed throughout the facility, but in some cases, we will group them together. So, we're at booth 44. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, or you still don't know for sure what a public safety signal booster is, stop at our booth, and we'll be happy to talk to you, um, whether new construction or existing. And thank you all for letting me speak, and it's a great audience. Thank you.